Kerry, like Sturgis. Were you ever offered money to assassinate President Kennedy? Directly. On numerous occasions. Two Cuban brothers, Ignacio and Guillermo Novo Sampol, a Cuban pilot called Pedro Diaz Lance, and his friend, Orlando Bosch. At first, Meridi assumed this was to be just another armed smuggling engagement, just like many others she'd been on with Sturgis before. However, when they reached their Dallas motel, they were visited by someone Marita had met many times before, CIA agent E. Howard Hunt, who stayed almost an hour and paid Sturgis with cash stuffed in a very large envelope. This was the evening of November 21st, 1963, and Marita began to get worried. She knew that President Kennedy was visiting Dallas the next day. Becoming concerned, she pressed Sturgis as to the real purpose of the visit, and when he told her that for this one time, it had to be confidential, she decided she wanted out. Marita had no way of knowing that a great number of other people had made similar journeys that day. CIA pilot Tosh Plumley flew several assassins into Dallas Love Field without even being told who they were. From all over the country, radio operators, riflemen, drivers, false ID suppliers like Chauncey Holt and Bernard Barker, and getaway pilots like David Ferry, converged on the city. Whilst at the home of oil man Clint Murchison, a group of his Nazi friends were congregating to celebrate Kennedy's imminent demise. Due to the testimony of LBJ's mistress, Madeleine Duncan Brown, the mother of his illegitimate son, we now know that amongst these guests were J. Edgar Hoover and his homosexual lover, Clyde Tolson, who stood to lose the millions they'd invested in their host's oil business if Kennedy lived. Hoover also knew Kennedy wanted to replace him as head of the FBI. The two Brown brothers of Brown Brothers Harriman, who along with Cliff Carter, John Connolly, and Senator Joseph Yarborough, stood to lose millions from lost defense contracts because they knew JFK wanted to end the Vietnam War. Also present were Joseph Sevilla, head of the Mafia in Dallas, and the mayor of Dallas, Earl Cable, the CIA men who knew the president was serious about smashing the Central Intelligence Agency because he'd already fired Cable's brother, Charles. Having a drink with them was Chase Manhattan Bank Chief, John McCloy, a confirmed Nazi who had shared a box with Hitler at the 1936 Berlin Olympic Games, and Mafia Chieftain Carlos Marcello, who felt nicely at home rubbing shoulders with Sam Giancarlo's representatives, Jack Ruby, Richard Nixon, and Haroldson Lafayette Hunt. The media were represented by Eamon G. Carter, and the only one who might have felt a little out of place as he awaited his boss was the world-class marksman and serial killer Malcolm Wallace. Late in the evening, Lyndon Baines Johnson finally turned up and briefly went into the party. When he came out to greet Madeleine Brown, she said he was euphoric. Let's go back to that before, when, when Johnson came out of the meeting, uh, what did he say to you? He was so angry, he had a violent temper when he was upset. Well, let's use the, the exact words that he said to you, what did he say he, to you? He, uh, he grabbed me by the arm and he had this deep voice, and he said, after tomorrow, those SOBs will never embarrass me again, that's no threat, that's a promise. Johnson had clearly been told by the people in that room that everything was ready. Air Force number one, ladies and gentlemen, and the crowd.